what is up people what is up it is me l teddy 27 and i am back this is our 2021 pride month video the much anticipated pride month video where we talk all things not just lgbtqia plus but all things black over here we keeping it black black blackity black black over here okay so we're going to learn some things, we're going to edify ourselves, and we're going to celebrate our history, and we're going to show some pride this month. So let's get right down to it. Larry LeVan. Larry LeVan is a pioneer in the DJing industry. Larry LeVan was born in New York City at the Brooklyn Jewish Hospital on July 20th, 1954. He was a revolutionary DJ. He was best known as the heart of New York City's Paradise Garage, better known as the Gay Garage, which some describe as the prototypical modern dance club. As a teenager, Larry dropped out of high school and immersed himself in the ballroom scene where he was a dressmaker. Yeah, he was sewing up the dresses for all the girls down there to the ballroom. He got his professional start, though, as a DJ at the famed Continental Baths, standing in for legendary DJ Nicky Ciano, from whom Larry learned the three turntable technique and the importance of the Philly soul sound when DJing. By the mid 1970s, Larry was a beloved and popular figure in the New York City and New York City's queer community, known for the diva persona he cultivated back in ballroom at the House Balls. Just as disco was getting right around its peak in 1977, Michael Brody created the Paradise Garage. He created this club to match the sound that Larry LeVan wanted to create. All of the architecture, all of the acoustics of that building were made to the specifications of Larry LeVan's because he wanted people to have an experience. He didn't want them to, to just hear the music. He wanted them to feel the music. And so every architectural specific, specificity, all of the acoustics were designed to his liking. Throughout the garage's existence, Larry perfected a number of techniques that ultimately reshaped music, introducing the dub aesthetic into dance music and ushering in the post-disco pre-house era with his use of drum machines and synthesizers. He had permanent res residency at the Paradise Garage from its opening night until its final hours. After the garage closed in 1987, Larry, who'd been at the center of a community being ravaged by AIDS, struggled to find work. He did, though, make a comeback in the 1990s, where he began touring in Japan and all over the globe as a celebrity DJ, dawning the birth of the celebrity DJs that we know today. He also took up residency at London's Ministry of Sound. He would eventually die due to heart failure on November 8, 1992, at the age of 38. Essex Hemphill. Essex Hemphill is not just a LGBTQIA writer, he's the LGBTQIA plus writer and poet. He was born back in April 16th, 1957 in Chicago. Early in his life, he did though move to Washington, D.C., where he graduated from Baloo High School. Back in those younger years, he began writing poetry at the age of 14, writing about his own thoughts, his family life, and his budding sexuality. After graduation, he enrolled at the University of Maryland in 1975 to study journalism. He did, though, drop out of the University of Maryland just after his freshman year. And then he, though, continued to be a part of and interact with the D.C. art scene, performing spoken word, working on journals, and beginning to publish his first poetry chapbooks. He would go on to achieve his degree in English, though, at the University of the District of Columbia. In 1979, Hemphill and his colleagues started the Nathula Journal of Contemporary Literature, a publication aimed at showcasing the works of modern black artists. One of his first public readings was arranged by Nathula co-editor E. Ethelbert Miller at Howard University's Founder Library, where he performed beside and befriended filmmaker Michelle Parkinson. He also performed at institutions including Harvard University, University of Pennsylvania, UCLA, and dozens of colleges and universities around the country. In 1982, Essex Hemfield, Lucky Duckett, his close friend, and Wayson Jones, his university roommate, founded the spoken word group called Sinke, which performed in the Washington, D.C. area. Essex continued performing his rhythmic spoken word poetry 
and in 1983 received a grant from the Washington Project for the Arts to perform an experimental dramatization of poetry entitled Murder on Glass alongside Park Michelle Parkinson and Wayson Jones. Essex also began publishing his own collections of poetry during this time. He would go on to garner more national attention when his work was featured and included in the collection of poetry entitled In the Life in 1986. It was an anthology of poems by black gay artists compiled by Hemphill's good friend, lover, and fellow author, Joseph F. Bean. His poetry has been published widely in journals and his essays have appeared in The Obsidian, Black Scholar, Callaloo, and Essex, among many other publications. In 86, Hemphill received a fellowship in poetry from the National Endowment of the Arts. He also made appearances in a number of documentaries between the years of 1989 and 1992, some of which were Looking for Langston, a film by Isaac Julian about poet Langston Hughes and the Harlem Renaissance. Essex would then also work with award-winning filmmaker Marlon Riggs on two documentaries, Tongues United in 1989, which looked into the complex overlapping of black and queer identities, a documentary I highly recommend, as well as Black Is, Black Ain't in 1992, which discussed the exactly, I'm sorry, which discussed what exactly constitutes blackness. After the death of his lover, Joseph F. Bean from AIDS in 1988, Essex and Bean's mom worked conjointly in order to publish the sequel to Bean's In the Life. This second manuscript was published in 1991 under the title Brother to Brother, New Writings by Black Gay Men which archived the works of about three dozen authors, including Hemphill himself. In 1990, he gave a speech to the Outright Conference, where he was the only black panelist, which eventually became the introduction to the anthology, and Brother to Brother would then go on to win a Lambda Literary Award. Hemphill would go on to travel the country as a lecturer and even as a visiting scholar at the Getty Center. During the 90s, though, he began to have complications with his health, but would rarely give any information on his health or speak on it publicly. The only times you would hear him talk about it is when he would say he was, um, he would occasionally talk about being a person with AIDS. It wasn't until 1994 that he wrote about his experiences with the, the disease in his poem, Vital Signs. He died on November 4th, 1995 of AIDS-related complications. Mel Boozer. Mel Boozer was born June 21st, 1945, and grew up in Washington, D.C., where he graduated as salutatorian of his class at Dunbar High School. Boozer attended Dartmouth College on a scholarship, and he entered that university in 1963 as one of only three African Americans admitted that year. Following his graduation, he studied for a Ph.D. at Yale University before becoming a professor of sociology at the University of Maryland. In 1979, Boozer was elected president of the Gay Activist Alliance of Washington, D.C., which he served for two one-year terms. He was the first African-American to serve as Gay, Alli Gay Activist Alliance president and became a leading moderate voice among black gays nationally. While president of the Gay Activist Alliance, the organization won unanimous passage of the Sexual Assault Reform Act by the D.C. Council, which decriminalized sodomy and repealed solicitation laws for consenting adults. Under pressure from the moral majority, which was a Christian right lobbying group, Congress exercised its power to overturn D.C. acts for only the second time in history when it repealed the Sexual Assault Reform Act that had been unanimously passed due to the work of Mel Boozer. During his leadership, the Gay Activist Alliance also saw establishment I saw and established the right for the same group to lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknowns in Arlington Cemetery and won a court battle with the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority for the right to place Metro bus posters reading, quote, someone in your life is gay, end quote. Boozer also wrote for Black Light, the first national gay black periodical founded by Sidney Brinkley. Mel Boozer was also then during the height of his career, nominated in 1980 for the Office of Vice President of the United States of America by the Socialist Party, and 
By petition at the convention, he was also nominated for the same office by the Democratic Party. He was the first openly gay person ever nominated for this office. Boozer spoke to the Democratic Convention in a speech televised in prime time, calling on the party to support equality for LGBT people. He went on to say, Would you ask me how I dare to compare the civil rights struggle with the struggle for lesbian and gay rights? I can compare them, and I do compare them, because I know what it means to be called a nigger, and I know what it means to be called a faggot, and I understand the differences in the marrow of my bones. And I can sum up the difference in one word, none. Mel Boozer received 49 votes before the balloting was suspended and then Vice President Walter Mondale was renominated by acclamation at the very same Democratic no National Convention. In 1981, Mel Boozer was hired by the National Gay Task Force as district director and a lobbyist. The National Gay Task Force Executive Director Virginia Apuzo fired him in 1983, replacing him with then Gay Activist Alliance President Jeff Levi. This had the effect of, quote, leaving the nation's oldest gay organization even wider, end quote, and drew protests from the other gay African Americans within the organization. In 1982, he co-founded the Langston Hughes Eleanor Roosevelt Democratic Club to advocate for black LGBT people in D.C., leading the club in 1983 and 1984. Boozer would die of an AIDS-related illness in March of 1987 at the age of 41 in Washington, D.C. He is featured in a panel of the AIDS Memorial Quilt. In, in 2019, Boozer was one of the inaugural 50 American Pioneer Trailblazers and Heroes inducted on the National LGBTQ Wall of Honor within the Stonewall National Monument in New York City's Stonewall Inn. The Stonewall National Monument is the first U.S. national monument dedicated to the LGBTQ rights and history, and the wall's unveiling was timed to take place during the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots. Sean Sasser Sean Sasser was born October 25, 1968 in Detroit, Michigan, where he grew up and attended high school at Cass Technical High School. After graduating from high school, he attended the University of Chicago to study Near Eastern Civilizations and become an archaeologist. He commented that he wanted to be one of the first major black archaeologists to call the bluff on all this Egyptian stuff that was stolen by other cultures. However, once he got to school, he found himself bored and depressed and barely completed his freshman year. Sean dropped out of college and initially intended on just leaving for a year, taking a year off and returning to the University of Chicago. However, he never went back. He then came out as gay to his devoutly religious mother who did not take it well at all. And because of pressure from his mom and other family members, he attempted to enlist in the United States Navy, explaining that, quote, I didn't want to be gay anymore. I thought it would work. You know, the discipline, all that stuff, end quote. But he, could, but he couldn't even enlist in the Navy because due to a mandatory blood test, he, it was revealed that the 19-year-old Sean was indeed HIV positive. He decided to enroll, though, in culinary school as he had always been fond of cooking and wanted to open his own restaurant. After finishing school, Sean found jobs cooking in local Chicago restaurants, but was too fixated on the idea of dying from AIDS. Realizing that he needed to figure out how to keep living, he moved to San Francisco, whose greater HIV awareness and diversity allowed him to find people he more easily related to, specifically HIV-positive people of color closer to his own age, which raised his spirits. Sean joined a youth HIV positive movement that advocated attention for adolescents with the disease and began speaking to groups about his own experience with HIV. He subsequently assisted a support group called Bay Area Positives for young people of color. Sean attended the 1993 Lesbian and Gay March on Washington where he introduced himself to a fellow AIDS educator named Pedro Zamora. Sean encouraged Zamora after their meeting to call him if Zamora ever visited San Francisco. Sean subsequently learned that the producers of The Real World were looking for an HIV-positive person to cast in the 1994 season in San Francisco, where Sean had been living for a couple years and eventually learned that the person cast was Pedro Zamora, whom he felt was ideal for the role. Sean had been living in San Francisco for a couple years in the 90s when Zamora moved into The Real World San Francisco loft. 
Pedro and Sean began dating. Pedro asked the show's producers for permission to go out on a second date without cameras so that he and Sean could get to know one another in a more natural setting. After the producers allowed this, Sean and Pedro fell in love and their relationship became a focal point of the season. During that season on The Real World, San Francisco, Sean proposed to Pedro Zamora and the two exchanged vows in a commitment ceremony in the loft. This was the first ceremony of its kind for a same-sex couple in television history. After production on The Real World stopped in June of 1994, Pedro Zamora visited his family in Miami before returning to San Francisco to live with Sean. In 1994, Pedro was diagnosed in New York City with progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or no, better known as PML. He was given three to four months to live. On September 3rd, Pedro was flown to Mercy Hospital in Miami where his family could be close to him. His family was not accepting of Sean, however, and, be, and because of his PML, Pedro gradually lost the ability to speak and was unable to explicitly communicate to his family the importance of Sean in his life. This led to confrontations between Sean and the Zamora family, who told him that, quote, Pedro did not need to have a lover anymore, end quote, and mostly excluded Sean from Pedro during his final days. Pedro died on November 11th, 1994. Sean returned to San Francisco two days later. Six months after Pedro's death, he resumed his speaking engagements for LGBT and HIV issues. In 1995, he spoke at the inaugural White House AIDS Conference and was appointed by President Bill Clinton to the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. He moved to Atlanta in the late 1995 in order to be with his boyfriend and hoped to open a cafe. In July 2013, Sean, who had been HIV positive for 25 years, was diagnosed with mesothelioma, a rare cancer of the lungs. He would go on to pass away at his home on August 7, 2013, at the age of 44. Sean Sasser's relationship with Pedro Zamora is credited with breaking a taboo against showing two men in a loving, stable relationship on television. Real World Miami cast member Dan Renzi, himself openly gay, stated, quote, Long before Ellen or Will, or, or Will and Grace showcased gay people on TV living mainstream lives, and before the magic of protease inhibitor cocktails turned HIV into a manageable disease, Sean Sasser gave a brave face to both issues and brought those taboo topics to educate millions of young Americans. End quote. The Sean Sasser Memorial Endowment Fund at AIDS United was established in September of 2013 to mobilize support for programs that improve the health outcomes of gay men of color. Sean's widower, Michael Kaplan, is the CEO of AIDS United. In June 2020, Sean Sasser's name was added to the names of American Pioneers, Trailblazers, and Heroes on the National LGBTQ Wall of Honor within the Stonewall National Monument in New York City Stonewall Inn. Glenn Burke Glenn Burke was born November 16, 1952 in Oakland, California. He was a Major League Baseball player for the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Oakland Athletics from 1976 to 1979. He was the first Major League Baseball player to come out as gay to his teammates and team owners during his professional career and the first to publicly acknowledge it when he stated on camera, quote, they can't ever say now that a gay man can't play in the majors because I'm a gay man and I made it, end quote. At the beginning of Glenberg's professional baseball career, he was often called, quote, the next Willie Mays. However, more than anything, prejudice kept Glenn from meeting those expectations. Upon being calling up to the Dodgers Major League Club, General Manager Al Campanis offered to pay him a large sum if he agreed to marry. Before refusing the offer, Burke responded, To a woman? <laughs> Despite this initial pressure, during his time with the Dodgers, Burke was known as the life of the team on the buses, in the clubhouse, and everywhere. In October of 1977, Glenn Burke ran onto the field during a game to congratulate then-teammate Dusty Baker on Dusty Baker's 30th home run of the season. As Baker jogged from third base to home, Burke raised his hand over his head. Unsure of what to do with his teammate's upraised hand, Baker slapped it. The two men, one of whom by that point was openly gay to his teammates and coaches, are credited with inventing the high five. 
which later became a symbol of identification and gay pride when Glenn Burke lived in the San Francisco Castro district. Despite popularity on the Dodgers, though, Burke was traded to the Oakland A's in 1978, where the open secret of Burke's sexuality was met with open prejudice. When Billy Martin became general manager in 1980, for example, he often referred to Burke as a, quote, faggot, end quote. When he suffered a knee injury before the 1980 season, the Athletics sent Burke to the minors and then released him from his contract. Glenn Burke would go on to say, quote, prejudice drove me out of baseball sooner than I should have been. Prejudice just won out, end quote. Glenn Burke died of AIDS-related complications on May 30th, 1995. He was 42. On August 2nd, 2013, Glenn Burke was among the first class of inductees into the National Gay and Lesbian Sports Hall of Fame. Dr. Alan Leroy Locke. A famous quote of Dr. Locke was, all classes of people under social pressure are permeated with a common experience. They are emotionally melded as others cannot be. With them, even ordinary living has epic depth and lyric intensity. And this, their material handicap, is their spiritual advantage. Alan Locke was born September 13, 1885 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was an American writer, philosopher, and educator best known as the philosophical architect, the dean or father, as some would say, of the Harlem Renaissance. After graduating from Harvard in 1907, Locke was selected as a Rhodes Scholar, the first African-American selected and the last one selected until 1960. In 1912, Dr. Locke became an assistant professor at Howard University before returning to Harvard, Harvard in 1916 writing his dissertation on the subjectivity of opinions and social biases. Returning to Howard as chair of the philosophy department in 1918, Locke taught some of the first classes on race relations leading to his dismissal in 1925. He was reinstated in 1928 and remained at Howard until his, his retirement in 1953. Locke Hall on the Howard campus is named in his honor. In March 1925, Dr. Locke guest edited the periodical survey graphic. The issue titled Harlem Meckham of the New Negro introduced white readers to the flourishing Harlem, Harlem Renaissance. In December 1925, Locke expanded the issue into the, Negro, the New Negro, an Interpretation, an anthology of work by black writers including himself, Count Cullen, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, W.E.B. Du Bois, and James Weldon Johnson. The New Negro is considered the definitive text of the Harlem Renaissance. Allen was a gay man, though he lived his personal life in semi-secrecy. In a 1949 letter, Allen, who was also below average height, commented on being born in America with three minority statuses. Quote, had I been born in ancient Greece, I would have escaped the first, homo the first homophobia. In Europe, I would have been spared the second U.S. racial segregation. In Japan, I would have been above rather than below average height. End quote. In dealing with his sexuality, Allen knew that given the discriminatory laws against it, against it, he could not be fully open about his orientation. He referred to it as a point of vulnerability and invulnerability, representing an area of both risk and strength. After his retirement from Howard University in 1953, Allen moved to New York City. He would go on to live until June 9, 1954, where he died at Mount Sinai Hospital. Count Cullen. Count Cullen, born Count Leroy Porter, was born May 30, 1903. Count was, was an American poet, scholar, and author, best known as the Poet Laureate of the Harlem Renaissance. Cullen was brought to Harlem at, at the age of nine by Amanda Porter, believed to be his paternal grandmother, who cared for him until his death in 1917. In 1925, as he entered a graduate program at Harvard, Cullen published Color, his first collection of poems, which included many of his best known works, such as Heritage, Incident, and Yet Do I Marvel. Color proved vital to the foundation of the Harlem Renaissance as a movement. Counte married twice, including to Yolanda Du Bois, daughter of W.E.B. Du Bois. Although he married twice, Count A was homosexual 
and maintained a long-term relationship with Harold Jackman, a school teacher well-known among Harlem's gay elite. Conte also had close relationships, some platonic, some romantic, some sexual, with queer artists and intellectuals like Langston Hughes and Carl Van Vechten, among others. In Gay New York, Professor George Chauncey tells of Dr. Alan Locke, the Dean of the Harlem Renaissance, giving Conte a copy of Edward Carpenter's Il Laos, a 1917 anthology outlining the cultural tradition of male-male friendship and love. Conte reported that he read the book in one sitting, as it made that which everyone said was unnatural seem natural. I loved myself in it, Cullen wrote. Dr. Locke also wanted to introduce a new generation of African-American writers, such as Count A, to the, re to the reading public. So Dr. Locke, so Dr. Locke sought to present the authentic natures of sex and sexuality through writing at that point, creating a kind of relationship with those who felt the same. Dr. Locke introduced Count A to gay affirming material, such as the work of Edward Carpenter, at a time when most gays were in the closet. In March 1923, Conte wrote to Locke about Carpenter's work, quote, It opened up for me soul windows which had been closed. It threw a noble and evident light on what I had begun to believe because of what the world believes, ignoble and unnatural, end quote. Conte is lauded as one of the most prolific writers of the Harlem Renaissance, standing alongside the greats such as Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes. Conte would later go on and live in New York, but on January 9th, 1946, he died at the age of 42. Ortez Alderson. Ortez Alderson was born in 1952 in Buffalo, New York, and was raised in, on Chicago's South Side. He was an actor and activist, best known as a founding member of Chicago's queer liberation movement, a leader of New York City's Act Up, and a founder of Majority Action Committee, an ACT UP subgroup focused on issues facing people of color. He became a leader of the Third World Gay Revolutionaries and was involved with bringing gay issues into the Revolutionary People's Constitution Convention, organized by the Black Panther Party in 1971. He was also an anti-draft and anti-war activist. In 1970, Alderson, co-founder of Chicago Gay Liberation's Black Caucus, was arrested with three others for destroying draft records in Pontiac, Illinois. The Pontiac Four, as they were known, became celebrities among anti-war activists, a position Alderson used to preach queer liberation at every chance. On Thanksgiving 1971, he organized a march in memory of James Clay, a trans woman who was shot and killed by police the previous year. He said, in a writing, transvestites are the most upfront part of our community. After moving to New York in 1981, Ortez joined ACT UP in 1987, and he was a huge figure for younger members. With his background in theater and radical activism, he not only helped set up ACT UP's defiant tone, he also forced the community to face its internal prejudices. Ortez, Robert Vasquez Pacheco said later, would just get up in front of the room and start talking about the issues of people of color all the time. Ortez's persistence in part led to the formation of the Majority Action Committee. Alderson Ortez returned to Chicago in 1989. He would soon after die of AIDS-related illness at the age of 38 on December 21, 1990. In 1991, Ortez was inducted into Chicago's LGBT Hall of Fame. On, a, on October 11, 1992, during ACT UP's first Ashes action, Arthur Gersh, Ortez's life partner, flung Alderson's ashes onto the White House lawn. Perry Watkins. Perry Watkins was once quoted as saying, every white person that I know who checked the box, yes, I'm a homosexual, was told, nope, you can't join the military, but I'm drafted. This was probably very common practice, particularly among people who felt like, oh, well, yes, let's send all the blacks to Vietnam. Perry Watkins was born August 20th, 1948 in Joplin, Missouri. Perry never lied about being gay, not to his family, not in high school, and not, to his, and not on his draft registration form. As an admitted homosexual, he moved with his family as a teenager and attended Tacoma Lincoln High School in Tacoma, Washington, where he was open about being gay. 
He studied dance and won speech tournaments all over the city. In August 1967, he was living in Germany where his stepfather was serving in the U.S. military. When he was drafted and at his initial examination told an army psychiatrist that he indeed was gay. During his induction examination in Tacoma, Washington in May 1968, he stated that he was homosexual when asked, but the doctor still categorized him as, quote, qualified for the military, end quote. He did not take any legal action or protest being drafted. Initially assigned to serve as a chaplain's assistant, Watkins was removed from the position because he was gay, but not discharged. He was trained as a personnel clerk. When harassed for being gay, he made his willingness to defend himself clear and was left alone. Throughout his military career, he made no secret of his sexual orientation. After being discharged at the end of his tour, at the end of his tour of duty on May 8, 1970, he found himself unable to find, find a good job and a year later reinstated in order to further his education. He again, he again affirmed his sexual orientation and was readmitted. At times, he dressed in drag and performed as a female impersonator under the name Simone, first in civilian life and then while stationed in West Germany, where he performed at shows sponsored by the army. Oh yes, Perry was a drag queen way back in the day. His success led to engagements at enlisted men's clubs and other U.S. bases in Europe. At one point in 1972, military investigators considered removing him from the service on account of his sexual orientation, but ended their investigation with the conclusion that his own admissions were insufficient and closed their investigation when Watkins would not provide the names of any others that were also gay. Other assignments took him to Korea and to Italy. Perry re-enlisted for a six-year term in 1974. Another investigation of his sexual orientation ended in October 1975 with the decision that his excellent service record warranted his retention despite his homosexuality. His security clearance was reviewed after another investigation in 1978 at the insistence of his commanding officer. He enlisted for another three years in 1979, the third time he, re he had re-enlisted without being challenged and decided to serve 20 years in the Army to, in order to retire with a pension. He earned a BA in Business Administration, stationed in Tacoma, Washington, where he had grown up. Another review of Watkins' security clearance led the Army to revoke it preventing his promotion from Staff Sergeant to Sergeant First Class. In February 1981, represented by an ACLU attorney, he appealed the denial of his security clearance. He wrote in his appeal, quote, I submit that I have been consistently penalized for my honesty. I will always continue to admit my homosexuality in the future. The Army has seen fit on numerous occasions to decide that my homosexuality is no obstacle to my military career, end quote. When the Army did not acknowledge Watkins' letter of appeal, his attorney filed suit in federal district court in Seattle. The Army responded with discharge proceedings. Under new regulations that deemed admission of homosexuality, even in the absence of any overt acts, sufficient grounds for dismissal, Watkins' letter admitting homosexuality would be used against him. The Army, despite losing in court and settling its dispute with another gay serviceman, Leonard Matlevich expected, expected to win its case with Perry. The Army cited Watkins' failure to answer questions about his intentions with respect to future homosexual conduct, but in October 1982, District Judge Barbara Rothstein ruled for Watkins, finding that the Army was stopped from using Watkins' statements against him after repeatedly allowing him to serve and granting him security clearances despite knowing he was gay. As the case proceeded, the Army allowed Watkins to re-enlist for another six years with the understanding that he would be separated from the military if the district court's decision was upheld. In 1983, the Army prevented him from dancing in drag at an Army Recreation Center in Fort Lewis, Washington. A three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the district court's decision in 1983, finding that the lower court could not require Army officials to act in contradiction of Army regulations unless the regulations themselves were ruled invalid. Perry was separated from the service at the end of his enlistment period in 1984. He worked in, Tacoma, in the Tacoma Office of the Social Security Administration from 1984 until 1994. Perry continued to challenge his discharge on the grounds that the military's policy of excluding gays and lesbians was, from service was unconstitutional. In 1988, he commented, quote, for 16 years, the Army said being homosexual wasn't detrimental to my job. Then after the fact, 
they said it was. Logic is a lost art in the army. End quote. The American Psychological Association filed an amicus brief in his case when it reached the Ninth Circuit. A three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit decided two to one in favor of Perry in the Watson versus United States Army case. The court held that homosexuals constitute a, quote, suspect class, end quote, and that the court must apply, quote, strict scrutiny, end quote, to determine whether there is a compelling state interest that justifies a statute or regulation that distinguishes homosexuals as a category. Using that analysis, the panel held that the exclusion of homosexuals from military service violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. It specifically addressed only exclusion based on someone's sexual orientation, homosexuality as a status, not exclusion based on behaviors associated with one's sexual orientation, homosexuality as conduct. The New York Times accepted the distinction and praised the decision. Quote, gay people should not be denied the opportunity for military service solely on the basis of their sexual preference, as distinguished from their behavior. A military regulation that so trashes careers, talent, and tolerance deserves no respect from Congress or the courts. End quote. In June 1988, the Ninth Circuit agreed to rehear the case. The 11 judge panel found that the Army was stopped from using Perry's statements and behavior against him, but did not address the constitutional issues. It was the first time a U.S. appellate court ruled against the military's ban on service by gays in by gays and lesbians. The Bush administration sought Supreme Court review of that decision without success. Watkins initially planned to re-enlist, but settled instead for a retroactive promotion to Sergeant First Class of $135,000 in retro pay, full retirement benefits, and honorable discharge. Perry Watkins died on March 17, 1996, at his home in Tacoma, Washington, of complications related to AIDS. Billy Preston. Billy Preston was born September 2, 1946, in Houston, Texas, and moved to Los Angeles as a child. He was an American musician who performed with artists like Little Richard, Sam Cooke, Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, and the Beatles. As a solo artist, Billy produced a number of pop hits, including Will It Go Around in Circles and Nothing from Nothing. Noted as a child prodigy, Billy was entirely self taught and never had a music lesson. By the age of 10, he was playing organ on stage, backing several gospel singers, such as Mahalia Jackson. At 11, Billy appeared on an episode of Nat King Cole's NBC TV show, singing the Fats Domino hit, Blueberry Hill, with Nat King Cole himself. He also appeared in St. Louis Blues, the 1958 W.C. Handy biopic starring Nat King Cole, where Billy played Handy as a younger child. Although Billy built a career in the 1960s as a legendary studio and touring musician, his work with the Beatles made him a household name. In 1969, when the Beatles were in the midst of a session recording Let It Be, George Harrison stormed out of the studio and went to a Ray Charles show where he saw Billy Preston, who the Beatles first met in 1962 on organ. Harrison invited Billy to the studio where his presence temporarily calmed the tense session. Billy's piano and organ is prominent on Abbey Road and Let It Be, and he is best known for the organ on Get Back. Following the Beatles' breakup, Preston enjoyed a great deal of success throughout the early 1970s, writing and recording his hit songs like That's the Way God Planned It, Out of Space, Will It Go Round in Circles, Nothing from Nothing, and You Are So Beautiful. He also recorded and toured with the Rolling Stones from 1970 to 1977. Although the details did not become fully known to the general public until after his death, Billy struggled throughout his life to cope with his sexuality and the lasting effects of the traumatic sexual abuse he suffered as a boy. Although his sexual orientation became known to friends and associates in the music, in the music world, such as Keith Richards, Billy did not publicly come out as gay until just before he died, partly because he felt it conflicted with his deeply held religious belief, beliefs and his lifelong association with the church. He was in the closet until shortly before his death. In his autobiography, Life, Keith Richards mentioned Billy's struggles with his homosexuality. Beginning in the late 1970s, Billy's financial, legal, and personal battles, including his addictions to alcohol and cocaine, and his inability to reconcile his homosexuality with his strict Christian upbringing, took a toll on him. 
Billy still, though, made a great living touring as a musician and singing some of his most beloved songs. Billy Preston died from complications of malignant hypertension on June 6, 2006. He was 59. As you can see, the history of black men in the LGBTQIA plus history and the movement is sound and is everywhere. You can't talk about the history of LGBTQIA plus without talking about black men and the part that they played in it. We are black. We are gay. We celebrate all of our blackness. We celebrate all of our gayness. We celebrate these pioneers who without many of us wouldn't be able to live as freely as we do today. I honor them here on my platform. I hope that you would also honor them during this, the 2021 Pride Month, where we will continue to celebrate all that is LGBTQIA+. It's been my pleasure bringing this to you. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, I'm L. Teddy 27 Thank y'all for coming. Y'all drive safely.